Let's focus on simple and easy ways to distinguish between endometritis and chorioamnionitis so you can score more points on your ob gyn shelf step 2 or step 3 exam. Endometritis is an inflammation or irritation of a lining of the uterus called the endometrium. However, it is also possible for it to cause an inflammation of other layers such as the myometrium or parametrium. It is the number one cause of postpartum fever. It occurs due to a polymicrobial infection with around two to three ascendant organisms such as group B strep, urea plasmal, or gardnerella. It is the number one cause of postpartum fever, so it's very important to understand and know this topic very well. The greatest risk factor for the development of endometritis is a C-section. So it's important to have a very high clinical suspicion if a patient presents two days post-op with a fever. Operative vaginal delivery may also be another risk factor for the development of endometritis. However, the risk of developing endometritis is considerably higher if a patient does a C-section. Prolonged rupture of membranes, multiple cervical examinations, as well as retained products of conception after delivery are other main risk factors for endometritis. If the mother is known to have a history of infections or conditions such as group B strep, chlamydia, gonorrhea, or an HIV positive mother, then this increases their risk of endometritis. These patients can present with a fever greater than 24 hours in the postpartum period. They may also experience lower abdominal pain as well as uterine tenderness. Purulent and foul-smelling lochia can also be noted. These patients can also complain of chills and malaise. The diagnosis of endometritis is mainly clinical. However, we can do other tests to confirm the diagnosis or possible cause of the endometritis. These include urine or blood cultures, as well as a gram stain or wet mount of vaginal discharge. It's also possible that the patient may need an ultrasound. This may detect the presence of retained products of conception. Complications of endometritis includes the development of postpartum sepsis, intrauterine adhesions, and septic pelvic thrombophlebitis. Treatment of these patients usually include IV antibiotic treatment. We can remember these drugs with the mnemonic ECG. So as you can see here, those letters are highlighted in red. E for endometritis, C for clindamycin, and G for gentamicin. As previously mentioned, retained products of conception may be a possible cause of endometritis. In this case, curatage may be beneficial for these patients. If they develop life-threatening complications such as postpartum hemorrhage that is not responsive to medical treatment, then these patients may need a hysterectomy as well. Chorioamnionitis is a bacterial infection that occurs before or during labor. Its risk factors relates to anything that exposes the mother to repeated or prolonged exposure to bacteria. These include prolonged rupture of membranes, prolonged labor, repetitive vaginal exams, as well as immunocompromised states such as HIV infection. These patients must have maternal fever as well as any one of the following three conditions. Number one, fetal tachycardia greater than 160 beats per minute. 
Number two, maternal leukocytosis. And number three, purulent amniotic fluid. This amniotic fluid may also be malodorous. These patients can also present with uterine tenderness and pelvic pain. Choreaminitis can also be a clinical diagnosis. However, you can do some tests to support or confirm this diagnosis. And this can be done through checking the maternal leukocyte count, which would be elevated, as well as doing cultures on the amniotic fluid or any vaginal secretions. Checking for group B strep can also support the diagnosis. These patients are treated with IV antibiotics as well. These include ampicillin and gentamicin. It can be remembered with a mnemonic CAG. It kind of sounds like a trinucleotide repeat. We can divide potential complications of chorioaminitis into maternal and neonatal complications. Maternal complications include the development of endometritis, uterine atony, which can possibly lead to postpartum hemorrhage, shock, venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and even death. Neonatal complications include preterm birth, asphyxia, intraventricular hemorrhage, neonatal infections such as pneumonia and encephalopathy, and again, even fetal death. So as you can tell, chorioamnunitis and endometritis have a lot of overlapping features. They both cause maternal fever, purulent or malodorous fluid, they're both treated by IV antibiotics and their maternal complications overlap. For your shelf or your board exams, a key way to distinguish between them is that chorioamnionitis occurs in women who are pregnant, while endometritis occurs in women in the postpartum period. So that's why chorioamnionitis had complications for both the mother and the baby. However, endometritis had many complications for the mother. Also, when you look at the criteria to diagnose chorioamnionitis, you realize that the number one thing listed there was fetal tachycardia greater than 160 beats per minute. So diagnosing it, its clinical features, as well as its complications closely tie together the mother and the baby. I remember this with the two C's, the C in choreomnitis and the C for currently pregnant. So that lets me know that patients with choreomnitis are currently pregnant. Another key distinguishing way are there risk factors? So the number one risk factor for chorioaminitis is prolonged rupture of membranes or prolonged labor. However, for endometritis, the number one risk factor is C-section. Although both of these conditions require treatment with IV antibiotics, it's important to note that they are different. Like mentioned before, the antibiotics for endometritis can be recalled with the mnemonic ECG, endometritis, clindamycin, gentamicin. However, chorioamnionitis is treated with IV ampicillin and gentamicin. It's very important to note that these antibiotics are given together. It's not in either or situation. So both of them are given to treat their respective conditions. And that brings us to the end of this video. If you have any other mnemonics to remember this topic, comment down below. Also, if you realize any other high yield ways to distinguish between them, let us know in the comment section too. As always, if you liked this video, power up the like button, hit subscribe and that notification bell. And to continue learning, click this video right here.